What do you have to do to survive in this business for a quarter of a century? Well, I think that uh, it's a, a unique combination of, uh, of uh, being numb, <laughs> of, uh, of not listening to people when they say that uh, you know, the, the odds are against you, figuring they're talking about everybody else but you. And uh, so it's a combination of ego and stupidity. Perhaps you're best known for the Austin Powers trilogy, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what it was like to score those movies, and what did those movies do for your career? Well, the, it was great to score those movies, and the, the first one was a hoot. Just Everybody was just having fun. Nobody knew that it was about to become Austin Powers. It was just Jay and Mike and everybody involved in it, and then me when I got involved. We we're also huge fans of, of films from that era, and this was such an homage to films from that era, uh, the first Austin Powers, uh, that everybody wanted to, to do the best that they could do to pay homage to that rather than just ripping it off and, and making fun of it. And so it was sort of an adventure in, in getting to recreate all those wonderful things that you loved about those kinds of movies when you first saw them. So everybody had this wonderful sense of uh, just exploration and, and enjoyment. Uh, the second one came out, it was after the groundswell that the first one had created as a DVD and video. Uh, it actually did better on DVD and video than it did in the theaters when it first came out. So everybody was waiting for the second Austin Power, so it was a little more at stake. And so the, the concept for Jay and Mike and myself and everyone involved with it was to go up several notches, not just one notch from the first one, but to make it you know, just the best that it could possibly be. And of course, everybody sets out to do that, but I think that we were really able to push it into a whole other zone. So that by the time the third one came along, it was, well, it was like they got, he got to finally have laser, sharks with laser beams on their head. You know, Dr. Evil finally got to have that. The budget was big enough. And I finally got to have a choir. You know, so the budgets got bigger, uh, but so did the, the risks for Mike specifically and everyone involved in it because you want to make sure that you're, you're uh, succeeding by going up uh, in terms of the quality, in terms of the success. You got a Grammy nomination for arranging Soul Bossa Nova. Have you heard from Quincy Jones about the sort of resurrection of that great old 60s classic? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, he and I uh, shared the arrangement credit uh, because I did use some of the elements from his original. But that piece dates back to 1962 on an album called Big Band Bossa Nova. And he just threw it together in the studio you know, to put it on this, uh, this CD and actually had some Brazilian players on it. And uh, Mike Myers fell in love with it. I think it was Chris Doritas who introduced him to it uh, by sending over a bunch of 60s stuff. And even before the movie had been made, Mike had fallen in love with this piece of music and it, you thought of it as being the essence of what Austin was about. So, you know, it was a, a given that it was going to become an element in the film. The fun part for me was getting to re-record it so that it sounded like it was from that era because a lot of the, the charm of that piece of music is the way that those sounds were recorded. So that was a lot of fun. And um, the, the other thing I was going to say, oh yes, Quincy and I have spoken. In fact, uh, uh, I call him every now and then to find out what he's up to. And he's either going to South Africa to start a new Silicon Valley there, or he's been being courted by the Chinese government to start a, a, a pop music industry over there. I mean, it's amazing the, the level this guy lives on. But he was kind enough to send me a, a letter uh, congratulating me for this, this award.